worrisome. The government was supposed to give a boost to seniors and the poorest of the poor, but it does not. It should have given a boost to the small and medium-sized businesses that are most affected by the high inflation. We can think of family farms, cab drivers, bosses, and nothing for them. Daddy Ottawa describes the problem of inflation, but doesn't help them. I want now to give you an example that shows how Ottawa names the problem but does nothing. And a concrete example in the budget is that there is a section on the problem with the shortage of semiconductors. In Quebec, we have specialized companies that we're proud of, companies that have been operating for generations. These companies adapt trucks to, for example, make ambulances, armored trucks, or they add adapted loading boxes. Uh, we have the specialty in Quebec, and the shortage of semiconductors means that the big truck manufacturers are hardly producing anymore, and our specialized companies can no longer get the supplies they need. We've been calling on the minister about this subject for months. In December, we gave our support to C2 because she assured us that the shortage problem was on the verge of being resolved and that she would even send us the figures to prove it. And we believed her in good faith and we've never seen the figures. But it was all wrong because the problem got worse. Companies are now facing bankruptcy. We're in danger of losing forever these specialized sectors that have existed for generations. The role of government is to support businesses to get through this crisis. The companies got together. They called on the government. They asked to meet with the minister. The bloc has been waiting for a meeting on the subject for months. Radio silence. But in the budget, the minister names the problem with the shortage of semiconductors, but she doesn't do anything to solve it. She does nothing to save this sector, which is important to the Quebec economy. All she says is that in the long run, the government will look into phototonics to see if we can perhaps create our own semiconductors, but we don't know when. That's not the problem. What we need is to give a boost to our companies that are going to close because Ford and GM are hardly producing any more trucks because of the shortage of semiconductors. We just need to support them until the American giants can start producing again. Is it because these specialized sectors are in Quebec that Ottawa is abandoning them? If it were in Ontario, would Father Ottawa have acted? I'm very concerned, Mr. Speaker. We're talking about multiple crises, and the major crisis right now is the environmental crisis. Uh, there is an environmental crisis, and we have to take action. It's really important to act now if we want to avoid the worst. Uh, while the IPCC tells us that we must announce all new hydrocarbon projects, if we still want to have a chance of avoiding the worst, Father Ottawa is doing the opposite. It's sending its environment minister to announce uh, a billion-barrel project. The man who founded Equiterre with Laura Waradell and who even climbed the CN Tower for the environment when he was working for Greenpeace. In one gesture, in one decision, he dealt a terrible blow to the planet. Few humans have ever done so much damage to the climate. With this gesture, he discarded all of his past involvement, his values, his commitments. He sold out to serve Father Ottawa, which is an oil state and an environmental dunce. Elsewhere in the world, environmental ministers have resigned for far less. And now, this is what he will be remembered for. I remember, I remind you what General Pétain said, and, and it's, he's not remembered for winning the Battle of Verdun. A minister of the environment, or pollution, chose to make his announcement on the eve of the budget, and just before the House was to recess for two weeks. It was quite calculated. Uh, I thought that to try to compensate for this compromise, we would find extraordinary measures for the environment in the budget. But no, mostly we have a lot of big fuzzies, a possible public-private fund like the Infrastructure Bank, which is a flop. What is concrete is the support for the fossil fuel sector, billions for carbon capture projects and the oil sands, technology that has not been perfected and that will cost a fortune if it ever does materialize, according to data from the International Energy Agency. If the private sector bore the costs, the, co the price of gas at the pump would quadruple. On top of that, Father Ottawa is announcing that it will support the development of small, mobile nuclear reactors to allow the industry to extract more oil and sell the saved gas. That's a being environmental for the government, despite all the risk and stakes for the planet. Put in another way, on Wednesday, the Ministry of the Environment announces a billion-barrel project, and the next day, the Minister of Finance announces more support for the 
oil and gas sector. That's uh, Daddy Ottawa's plan for the environment. Mr. Speaker, I want to quote La Presse journalist Philippe Mercure, who illustrates how Ottawa is going against the IPCC report. And I quote, the report includes long passages on the risks of lock in that is building new infrastructure that will pollute for decades and undermine our efforts. Uh, in fact, one would have thought that the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, was speaking directly to the Environment Minister when he presented the document on Monday. And here I quote the UN Secretary General, who said climate activists are sometimes, sometimes portrayed as dangerous radicals when the real dangerous radicals are, are the countries that are increasing fossil fuel production, investing in new fossil fuel infrastructure is morally and economically foolish, he said, end of quote. And now more than ever to be part of Canada is to choose the role of uh, working against the environment. We had five unconditional expectations and demands. The first of four are not included. Uh, health, seniors, funding of the green economy and a transition, an acceptable transition, concrete action for inflation, uh, at least there is something for the indigenous people. Hopefully for once the money voted will actually go to the, into the field to make a difference in the lives of indigenous peoples. Because until now what we see is that the money is voted but isn't spent, hence all the problems like access to clean water, which continues to go on and on. These problems are not being resolved. Uh, housing. Obviously, there isn't enough uh, money for affordable housing. For us, we need to ensure their social housing is funding. You can't call it affordable housing if people have to pay on realistic prices to rent a small place. So there is money, but nothing to address the problem in a serious way, and we need to do more. Mr. Speaker, as I said at the beginning of this speech, this is a context of multiple crises, and what we see in the budget is the government names the problems, they know the problems, but the solutions being proposed most of the time are inexistent or poorly selected. This is a problem. What we see, Mr. Speaker, in addition, is uh, an increasingly centralizing state that is interfering and wants to provide a mold, and here children, provinces in Quebec, what you thank, thank you to the member for Joliet for your speech. You will have about six and a half minutes uh, when we come back. Uh, we'll now statements by members. The Honourable Member for Milton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now that we have presented Budget 2022, our plan to grow the economy and make life more affordable, it's time to get back to our communities, and I can't wait to get back to Milton later today. It's April, and there's so much going on. It's the start of the holy month of Ramadan. It's Sikh Heritage Month, Vaisakhi, Passover, Puthandu, and later this month, Easter weekend. There are spring community festivals and local town cleanups like the one that I'm hosting with Sustainable Milton on Saturday the 16th. It might be a little bit rainy, but I can't wait for the tulips to come up in my garden. And of course, April is also Daffodil Month for Cancer Awareness. There's no question that it's been a really difficult couple of years on all of us. But as we emerge from a dark, long and exceptionally cold winter, I hope everyone in Milton gets the chance to spend a little bit more time outdoors. Commit to that morning jog, ride a bike to school or work, do some gardening or some hiking, or just enjoying the spring weather. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for West Nova. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, last Saturday night, I had the honour of dropping the pocket Mariner Centre in Yarmouth as the Mariners took on the Valley Wildcats from Berwick. Mr. Speaker, I'm proud to point out that these two great Junior A hockey teams are from my amazing riding of West Nova, and I committed to both teams to congratulate the winner in the House of Commons, maybe wearing a jersey. <laughs> Saturday night, the Mariners won 4-1, forcing a sixth game in the series, and the Valley Wildcats won the next day at home in Berwick, 4-2. They do the kips are fantastic, and you have a fat B. Both teams are incredible. 
and it was just so exciting to watch the hockey season. Start by a big congratulations to the Yarmouth Mariners, players and coaching staff, and of course the management, and of course the fans for a great season. And a huge congratulations to the Valley Wildcats, the players, their fans, their organization for all their hard work. They move on to a series starting tonight against the Truro Bearcats in the beautiful constituency of Cumberland Colchester, which I'm sure will be a great one, but go Wildcats, go! Thank you. Thank you. Go, go Wildcats. Uh, the member for Saint Laurent. Mr. Speaker, on March 22nd, 2022, the world lost a strong and inspirational young woman to stage four metastatic breast cancer. Throughout her nine-year battle with cancer, Nally experienced some of the darkest times that a human being can possibly face, and yet she always made room for light, inspiring so many others to do the same. She was an example to so many of my generation of what it meant to thrive with cancer. Nally's journey and her outlook on life changed the lives of everyone who followed her. Her message to us all remained consistent and powerful. No matter what obstacles life may throw your way, there is always a silver lining. It's about letting the light in and choosing to believe that every will, everything will turn out okay. What remains is the beautiful legacy that Nally left behind. She will continue to live on in the hearts of the thousands of people that she touched with her light and love. To her family and V, I wish to offer my deepest sympathies and to say thank you for sharing Nally with so many who so very much needed her hope, love, and light. To Nally, I have no doubt that you fulfilled your life's purpose here and that you are in a much better place. Thank you. The member for South Okanagan, West Kootenai. Mr. Speaker, today I rise to celebrate the life of Andrina Calvert, my constituency assistant in Penticton, who passed away from leukemia last month. Andrina was an assistant to Bob Ray when he was Premier of Ontario, and I was so fortunate to be able to hire her as my assistant in 2015. Andrina was one in a million, a kind person with a bright smile and a beguiling grin, and an almost infinite capacity to listen to people when they had difficult stories to tell, and someone who felt an obligation to give back to her community. She loved animals as much as she loved people, and volunteered for many local organizations and events. I pass on my condolences to her husband Jim, and all her extended family and many friends. You know, I would regularly meet people on the street who would say, please tell Andrina that she is an angel. She was indeed an angel, and I will miss her. We will all miss her so very much. Thank you. The member for Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, the Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance tabled a budget which aims to invest in the cornerstone of a growing, strong country, our population. In Sherbrooke, we have a major housing crisis. The budget's measures to increase the number and speed of, con of housing construction and repair will enable families, workers and seniors to have a safe and affordable home. These measures will encourage towns to build more housing by creating funds tailored to their needs and realities. It also encourages more affordable housing to be built by extending the Rapid Housing Initiative, a new generation of housing cooperatives, and doubling annual, annual funding to the Reaching Home program. In addition, we will be meeting the goal to ensure that at least 40% of new housing units' rental prices will be less than 80% of the average price, and that's great for people in my riding. The member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Yay. We know spring is in the air when rain is welcome, the warmer days are coming, and the Masters Golf is on at Augusta National. Let's go, Mike, Mackenzie and Connor. Hey. Locally, events are popping up all over our riding. Loyalist Easter Egg Hunt, Trinity United Craft and Vendor Sale in Madoc, Easter Market and Egg Hunt in Deseronto, Easter Bunny Photos in Aaronsville, exciting Easter Crafts in Northbrook, an archery competition in Napanee, and so much more. However, it's officially spring when hot crust buns are available at Hidden Gold Mine Bakery, and the kayakers have arrived in Queensboro. Yeah. Some of the pictures captured of the impressive jumps over Millpan Dam are fantastic. This weekend is MacFest in Queensboro. While you are there, you can have some warm treats on the Black River, all the while exploring this beautiful historic village. I encourage everyone, ask your neighbours, check out your local community papers, cable, Facebook groups, and if you have an opportunity, get some fresh air. 
support some local initiatives, and shop local. The member for Nepean. Mr. Speaker, it is with great sadness I speak about a major fire last week in Somaliland, which destroyed the Wahin market in Hargesa. With several thousand businesses destroyed, Hargisa Chamber of Commerce Chairman Jamal Aidid said this market accounted 40 to 50 percent of the city's economy. Thousands of people have lost their livelihood, and this is more painful as it happened in this holy month of Ramadan. This disaster is on the top of drought, FEMI, and food insecurity already in Somaliland. I call on Canada to take all steps immediately to help Somaliland and provide much needed funding support. I would like to recognize Somaliland Canadian Congress and Canadian Alliance to rebuild Hargesa market for their hard work in advocating and mobilizing the required support. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, for acknowledging me. I just want to share with this House how excited parents are in my community of Ottawa Centre with the announcement that we finally have a national child care and early program, early learning program in Canada. It is, Mr. Speaker, an absolutely a game changer for young parents who uh, want to be engaged in their kids' life but also participate fully in the workforce. It is clear, Speaker, that child care is not a luxury. It is a necessity for families. It is clear that child care is not a luxury. It is a necessity for families. Ontario, when uh, the Ontario Liberal government introduced the full day, uh, full day kindergarten uh, some uh, almost 10 years ago, now we have this wholesome early learning uh, program with kids having $10 a day, affordable, uh, bilingual quality child care and then within school setting to have full day kindergarten uh, as well. Speaker, I just want to very quickly thank uh, so many parents and advocates from Glebe Corp Nursery School, Andrew Flex Children's uh, Services and Centered Out Parents Corporate Daycare and many, many more who have been advocating on, on behalf of families and parents. Congratulations to them that we've got $10 a day child care in Ontario. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Edmonton West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to recognize the charitable work of the Saints Church in my riding of Edmonton West. Led by the dynamic duel of Linda Ross, or Lisa Ross and Linda Lowe, a great team of volunteers created and run a bread ministry to distribute bread to those in need. Every week, the team picks up bread donated by the incredibly generous Cobb's Bread on Winterburn Road to distribute to local families. The program started in October 2019 and is not one stop, even during the heights of the pandemic. Since the start of the program, the Bread Ministry has served over 5,000 families in need. Now, the pandemic has not been easy in our country, obviously, so I'm grateful to many places of faith who have stepped up to fill a void, to bring Canadians together, to simply help because it's the right thing to do. Saints Church and the Bread Ministry is one such place. Thank you, Senior pra our Pastor Brett, Lisa and Linda, and your ministry, and your church, for all your service to the people of Edmonton. The Honourable Member for Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Next weekend, millions of Canadians will be together with their family and friends for the Christian celebration of Easter, which honours the values of sacrifice, faith, renewal, and peace. Over this holiday weekend, I encourage all Canadians to take a moment and think about the many Canadians who cannot be home for Easter, including those in the Canadian Armed Forces. Whether you celebrate by going to church, giving back to your community through volunteering, or enjoy the age-old tradition of an Easter egg hunt, I wish everyone in Cambridge, North Dumfries and North Brant, and all Canadians, Happy Easter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Dauphin, Swan River, Nipawa. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, my constituency is proudly home to a vibrant Ukrainian community. I want to recognize some of my constituents who have stepped up to support the people of Ukraine. Locals in Dauphin initiated the Parkland Ukrainian Family Fund to support parents and children 
flee, fleeing to Canada. Grade 8 students in William Morton Collegiate in Gladstone raised over $2,800 for the Canadian Red Cross. Minidosa Collegiate students collected over 200 kilograms of essential items and over $3,000 in donations, Mr. Speaker. Wow. Wow. The municipality of Harrison Park has approved $20,000 in funding to support Ukrainians fleeing war. Mr. Speaker, there are many more constituents and communities who are opening up their homes and hearts to support the people of Ukraine as they flee their homeland from Putin's war. I want to sincerely thank each and every one of them for standing with Ukraine as they continue to fight for freedom. The Honourable Member from Calgary Centre. Mr. Speaker, like many Canadians, I'm blessed to have grown up with the descendants of Ukrainian immigrants who came to Canada after the pogroms visit on Ukraine by the Soviet regime after World War II. Those families and that culture are integral to our heritage. We all rejoiced when Ukraine joined the realm of free nations over three decades ago. Witnessing the carnage brought on Ukraine by Putin hits home. Friends are asking for help, for family and close connections that are doing what every family would in this situation, finding safety and hoping Canada can offer that. My friend, Zolt Vai, whose family fled communism and sought refuge here, has raised tens of thousands of dollars to help Ukrainians find safety. He's also working with Calgary companies to facilitate temporary solutions for those who cannot yet reach Canada. We have everything we need to help. Homes, resources, the means, and a tight-knit community with the people that need us now. Stop the delays. Bring these people to Canada now. Bravo. The Honourable Member for York Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, over, Mr. Speaker, Passover, Pesach, is one of the oldest and most transformative stories of hope. It tells how a powerless people found their way from slavery to freedom through faith and perseverance to become a nation. The story of the Exodus is defining for Jews around the world and a living symbol for communities of hope against adversity. As Jewish families and communities across Canada gather next Friday, we will be celebrating Passover with family for the first time in two long years. This year, with Ukraine and its Jewish communities fighting for their freedom and their lives, the story of Passover takes on new meaning in this holiday of spring and renewal. We retell the Passover story every year to remind ourselves that freedoms are never fully won and can never be taken for granted. We must fight for them and cherish them in every generation. On behalf of my family, I wish the Jewish community of York Centre and across Canada, Chag Pesach Sameach. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Mr. Speaker, I want to take this moment to acknowledge and thank the people of Edmonton who are stepping up to support Ukraine and the Ukrainians fleeing Putin's horrible war. The Ukrainian Canadian Congress of Alberta, along with the Ukrainian Canadian Social Services and the Ukrainian National Federation and the Ukrainian Women's Organization are helping families settle in Edmonton. The kids at St. Matthew's Ukrainian Bilingual School have collected an entire classroom full of essential items for Ukrainian refugees in our city. The Kalia Kids Child Care Program, a program that focuses on Ukrainian bilingual education, are offering free child care for new community members in Edmonton. The Canadian Polish Congress of Alberta hosted a concert in support of Ukraine on March 27 and raised $20,000. And the Belarusians of Edmonton are standing with Ukraine. They are hosting a fundraiser to date at this very moment at the Bountiful Farmers Market in Edmonton to buy first aid kits and medical supplies for Ukraine. Thank you to these amazing people and everyone in Edmonton who is standing with Ukraine. The Honourable Member for Abitibi Timiskaming. Well, Mr. Speaker, we're so close to winning the Cup. This weekend in Timiskaming, we'll be celebrating starting tonight. After two shutouts by Goli and Web Bouchard in the first two games, our Timiskaming Titans will be hosting the next matches in the Russell Cup playoffs, the big trophy in the General Metro Hockey League Ontario Junior Circuit. The previous champions were the other Timiskaming team, the Ville Marie Pirates. Confidence is a big part of what will help the Titans win the second Russell Cup in their short history of a dozen years on Saturday night. 
With Godbout, Fontaine, CPU, CRA, La Pointe, Stemke, Badanin, Kornilov, Daniel, Brooks, Lavalie, Colette, and Presso, the pack stands expected at the center will be bad news for the Durham Roadrunners. To owner Pascal Labranche, general manager Francois Risson, coach Sébastien Lacroix, and the whole team, including Denis Lacourse and driver Ken Richard, that I saw in Oshawa on Monday, well, we're going to see each other at 8 o'clock tonight for the third match and Saturday for the Cup. Go Titans! Not another deputy to Fort McMurray Cold Lake. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. April is Cancer Awareness Month. Janice Goodridge was a loving wife and mother, a successful small business owner, a fiercely loyal friend, and loved by nearly all. She made it clear that women could do anything they worked for, and she modeled work-life balance and service to others. Next week would have been my mother's 62nd birthday, but it's the 13th that we've spent without her. She had stage four breast cancer and passed away at 49. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't think of her kindness, her smile, her love of shoes, and her unconditional love. Early detection significantly improves outcome. So I will use this opportunity to remind everybody to do routine self-checks, talk to your doctor if you have concerns, and get screening and mammograms if you're eligible. It just might save your life. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth Cole Harbour. Mr. Speaker, two years ago this month, picturesque and peaceful Nova Scotian communities like Portapique, Wentworth, DeBert, Shubenacadie, and Enfield were the scene of senseless acts of extreme violence and murder. We don't bother to name the gunmen. We take time to remember the 22 beautiful lives who were lost, the futures that were stolen, never to come to fruition. We remember Jolene, Frank, Dawn, Gina, Alana, Sean, Lisa, Heidi, John, Joey, Jamie, Heather, Greg, Tom, Joanne, Kristen, Peter, Lillian, Corey, Joy, Aaron, and vibrant 17-year-old Emily Tuck, who shared her incredible fiddling skills, bringing joy to Nova Scotians at home during the pandemic, ending her tune with, there's some fiddle for you. And I'll never forget how folks across Nova Scotia came together in the face of this tragedy, that despite the anger, despite the pain and the loss, Nova Scotians did what we could to show each other how much we care and to remind each other that we are Nova Scotia strong. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the members for their statements today. Oral questions. Question Ra, the Honourable Member for Abbotsford. Yeah. Tax and spend policies have killed the Canadian dream. Every day we ask this government what it's doing to make life more affordable for Canadians. And every day they tell us how much money they're spending. It's not how much money you spend, it's about the results you deliver. And by that standard, this government has failed. Yesterday's budget was no different. Tax, 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 spend, 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 as the Prime Minister stokes the fires of inflation. What happened to his promise to stand up for the middle class and those looking to join it? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank my colleague for asking a question about the results we're delivering. This morning, Statistics Canada announced that we have the lowest unemployment rate in nearly 50 years. Mr. Speaker, we have recovered 115 percent of the jobs lost during the pandemic, and I would like to thank the hardworking Canadians from coast to coast who are rolling up their sleeves, getting to work, and creating growth for our country. I also know there was a little feedback on the table there, so make sure the headsets aren't near the, the, the microphones. The Honourable Member for Abbotsford. Well, the cost of home ownership has doubled. Food prices are through the roof. Fuel costs are at record highs. And yesterday's budget only made things worse. 
There was no help for those being left behind by this NDP Liberal government. No tax relief, no plan to fight inflation, only spend, spend, spend. Does this minister not realize that her tax and spend policies are driving millions of Canadians out of the middle class? When will this government finally take steps to control the skyrocketing cost of living? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, the Minister of Tourism and Associate Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite is raising housing, which happens to be one of the themes of our budget of yesterday. And housing is an important way that we are going to help Canadians uh, deal with the increased cost of living. Housing is incredibly important for us right across the country, and we are the government that has invested the most in the creation of housing. 90% of the investments in our budget on housing are on the supply side because we are going to build homes. Yeah. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Mr Speaker, today food is still more expensive. Housing is ever more expensive. The same for gas. Why? Because this government has not directly tackled the first problem for all Canadian families at all. Inflation. Inflation is at its highest in the past 30 years. That is the record of the Liberals. And the budget, there is nothing against this. Why is the government pretending there is no inflation when it's harming all Canadian families? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And my colleague has talked about the Can Liberals' record. Stats Canada today revealed that we have the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years, Mr. Speaker. We have recouped 115% of jobs lost in the pandemic. That is our record. Our plan is working. I would like to thank my colleague for his question. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Well, I would like to commend the Finance Minister's sense of humour because they said. Canada has a proud tradition of fiscal responsibility, and I will continue to do so. Is the minister not aware that for the past seven years, the government has done absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing to control expenditures, Mr. Speaker? It's doubled since the government has arrived, and the debt has also doubled to $1.2 trillion. That is the truth of the matter. $145 million a day, that's the cost. In four years with this government, it will cost us $43 billion a year. Why does the government refuse to do what all serious government must do? Control expenditures. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr Speaker, I'm pleased to talk about our budgetary record. Before the pandemic, we had the best record in all G7 countries today. After having spent to support Canadians throughout the pandemic, we have always, we always and still have the best record in all G7 countries. We are here for Canadians and we are also fiscally responsible. This budget proves it once again. The Honourable Member for... There's a third question for Louis Saint Laurent. My apologies. The Honourable Member for Louis Saint Laurent. Question number three. Mr. Speaker, we remember that before the election, the government had invented the concept of two different people, 75s and over, and the others. In this budget, they've made done with this. Good, but there is nothing, absolutely nothing for seniors. I'm not the one who's saying this, Mr. Speaker. I would like to quote. It's a sad day for low-income seniors who thought this budget would help them to face the increase in cost of living. The government has abandoned them. That's what Giselle Tessé-Goodman had to say. What? Does the government have to say to seniors, this government that has done absolutely nothing for seniors to f fight inflation? Mary to the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for the question. Budget 2022 provided great news and will make a real difference in the lives of seniors. Our government announced the creation of the Dental Care for Seniors program. Starting in 2023, seniors age 65 and up with a family income of less than $90,000 will be able to access dental care. An additional $20 million for the new Horizons for Seniors program to continue supporting seniors serving organizations. Up to $3,000 through the Home Accessibility Tax Credit for renovations expenses to make aging at home more accessible. Mr. Speaker, this member and this party have a chance to show finally that they support seniors in Canada. 
The Honourable Member for saint jean Mr Speaker, yesterday's budget was a swing and a miss. It offers no solutions to the biggest crises of our time, such as health care. First of all, there is no increase in transfers, which is completely out of touch after everything we've seen during the pandemic. But even worse, the government is being proactive, uh, being provocative rather, by writing in black and white that it's not even ready to discuss it after everything we have seen in our overflowing hospitals, in our long-term care homes. How is it even possible to table a budget that will not allow for the hiring of even one single more nurse? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Not even two weeks ago, we announced $2 billion for health care for provinces and territories, half a million of which is for Quebec and Quebec alone. The budget that my colleague has spoken about has $43 billion in Canada health transfers. Our government is here to protect the health care of Canadians. And we are proud of this. The Honourable Member for Saint-Jean. Mr Speaker, this doesn't even cover, cover rather inflation. This is a slap in the face to Quebec, to the provinces, and especially to healthcare workers. All healthcare professionals in Quebec have called for an increase in health transfers. Doctors, nurses, psychologists, physios, support staff. You name it, all the people who work in the field of healthcare for our people have asked for an increase. These are the people who work in the field day and night tirelessly. Not only is there a single penny more to help them, but the government is now telling them that it's not even willing to discuss it. Why not at least offer them a bare minimum, a bare modicum of respect by agreeing to meet them at a public summit? The Armour Parliamentary Secretary. Mr Speaker, our healthcare minister uh, is a minister for Quebec will be overjoyed to sit down with provinces and territories to find a Canada health care transfer agreement. But I would like to remind my colleague and remind this House that it is the federal government that paid 80% of pandemic-related costs. We haven't heard a peep from the Bleu Québécois with regards to jurisdictions or the fact that we paid and footed the bill of the pandemic. The Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. Mr Speaker, on the climate crisis, the Liberals still don't get it. The same week the IPCC releases a report saying we need to turn the corner in the next three years, they announced $2.6 billion in additional subsidies to oil companies, and they approved Bé du Nord, a new fossil fuel project. That is the problem with the Liberals. They think they can solve the climate crisis by giving ever more money to oil and gas companies. It doesn't make a lick of sense. Why won't the Liberals listen to science and invest in new green jobs? The Honourable Minister for the Environment. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for Rosemont La Petite Patrie for his question. I would like to remind the Honourable Member that in the IPCC report published this week, the IPCC refers to capture and storage for carbon, which is an essential technology for us to meet our net zero ambitions by 2050. That is exactly what we're doing here in Canada, Mr. Speaker. In the last budget, we will encourage the development of this technology and of all technology that will allow us to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Mr. Speaker, we will never achieve the government's net zero plan if we leave Albertan workers behind. Yesterday's budget was an opportunity to invest in Alberta workers, to help them transition to a new economy. Instead, the government continued the approach of giving billions to wealthy companies with no strings attached. Mr. Speaker, Albertans can't wait anymore. Where is the funding for a clean jobs training centre? And when is the just transition legislation coming? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, what I would say is actually there was significant funding in the budget to uh, work with Alberta and Saskatchewan and other provinces to diversify their econ economies. Four billion dollars for critical minerals. There was funding for CCUS, which is relevant to the whole conversation about hydrogen. In the previous budget, there was 1.5 billion dollars for clean fuels, which is biofuels and hydrogen. We are going to be working actively with the province of Alberta and with industry to ensure that we are moving forward in a manner that will create a clean economy, a prosperous economy, and one that will support workers and communities to make this transition. The Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Samilkameen Nicola. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr. Speaker, like 
everything in this spend DP liberal budget. What they announce is not what you get. Instead of a real ban on foreign ownership and housing as conservatives proposed, their so-called ban on, on foreign buyers is anything but. Under this policy, a foreign national can still purchase a home. If they separate from their spouse, they can buy another home. If their child turns 18 and wants to buy the house across the street, they still can. That does nothing to help put first-time home buyers first. Why is this so-called ban so full of holes that it's like Swiss cheese, Mr. Speaker? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Your affordable housing isn't just good social policy, it's a powerful economic policy as well. Our government will increase housing supply by doubling residential construction across Canada over the next 10 years. We will ensure that homes are treated as a place for families to live instead of as an investment vehicle. And we will build new pathways for first time home buyers. Mr. Speaker, in Canada, everyone deserves a place to call home, and Budget 2022 is going to help make that a reality. The Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Sam Milkami Nicola. Another spend EP Liberal housing policy that is not as advertised is their first time home buyer savings account. So many millennials can't go to the bank of mom and dad and instead have to scrimp and save every penny but don't qualify today for a mortgage because of the Liberal stress test. If those who are fortunate enough to have saved today can't get into a home, how in the world will it be any different for those millennials who will scrimp and save over the next five years in their shiny savings account when the stress te test balance? them as well. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, Canada has the strongest labour market recovery in the G7, having recouped 115% of the jobs lost during the pandemic. This includes 73,000 jobs in March, which has pushed Canada's unemployment rate to 5.3%. That is the lowest unemployment rate that Canada has seen in more than 50 years. Budget 2022 builds on this success by unwinding Canada's pandemic deficits and continuing to reduce our debt to GDP ratio while working to fight climate change and yes, investing in housing affordability. Honourable Member for Lambton, Kent, Middlesex. Hey. Hey. Speaker, the government asked young people to lock down for two years. They complied. Their reward? A housing market that they can't buy into and being saddled with a ton of debt to put them down. Damn. Debt is keeping housing unaffordable and this government keeps spending. Yeah. Why are millennials being shut out of the housing market for this Prime Minister's vanity projects? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. I'd like to thank my colleague for her question. You know, Canadians throughout the country have found that access to property is inaccessible, which is unacceptable. That's why Budget 2022 has tangible measures, a $200 million investment for finding a house and being able to afford a house, a new tax-free first home savings account, and a foreign home buyer's ban for two years, Mr. Speaker. That is true federal leadership, and I hope that for once the opposition will vote for these measures. Senator member for Lambton, Kent Middlesex. Well, Speaker, Carol, a senior in my riding, shared with me her concern that seniors and those with disabilities are at the bottom of the NDP Liberals' priorities. Seniors and those with dif disabilities are suffering very real stress, trying to afford to live while everything in their lives becomes more expensive. They're already slashed their budgets to account for inflation, and they just can't tighten their belts any further. Speaker, I care about Carol. Why don't the NDP Liberals? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As I was saying earlier, Budget 2022 has tangible and concrete measures. Not only will we invent, invest $10 billion in the years to come to increase how many houses are available in order to make sure that all Canadians, including seniors, have a place to live. For Simcoe North. Mr. Speaker, this budget adds about $1,400 in debt for every person in the country. Wow. Why is the answer to this government's problem always just adding spending and debt? Canadians are waking up today without relief for higher food or gas prices, but to find out they owe $1,400 more per person. Why do they want to saddle the future generation with this extra debt? Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary of the Minister of Finance. 
Mr. Speaker, the leader of the Conservative Party has already admitted that the extraordinary investments made over the course of the pandemic were necessary to protect Canadian families and Canadian workers. Our plan has worked. In fact, we have maintained the lowest net debt to GDP ratio in the G7 while growing the economy and recovering 115% of jobs lost due to COVID-19. Canada was able to do this because of our prudent fiscal management. It is now time to unwind the pandemic deficits and continue to grow our economy while reducing our debt to GDP ratio. This is what good fiscal managers do. The Honourable Member for Simcoe North. Mr. Speaker, good fiscal managers are increasing government spending 25% over pre-pandemic levels. But guess what? The government is benefiting from inflation. They're making $170 billion more than they projected just last year. But who's getting the benefit of that, Mr. Speaker? Not Canadians. No relief for food or higher gas prices. So, Mr. Speaker, why does this government have to say to the struggling Canadians who are seeing no relief in this budget? Well, Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, before the pandemic, it took only two Conservative governments to accrue more than 70% of Canada's pre-pandemic debt. That's because their fiscal ideology is to cut taxes for the wealthy and to cut services for everyone else. In stark contrast, our last Liberal government paid down our national debt significantly. We've demonstrated that you can be good fiscal managers while investing in Canadians, growing the economy and continuing to fight poverty and climate change. Budget 2022 will lower our debt to GDP ratio and help build a Canada where no one is left behind. The Honourable Member from Manicouagan. Mr. Speaker, 24 hours after approving the Béginard oil project, the government still disappoints in the environmental side of the budget, the main new measure on climate change. Hold on to your seat, Mr. Speaker, is a subsidy for oil companies once again. Instead of capping oil production, the government, with the support of the NDP, is offering $2.5 billion to oil companies companies for carbon capture, a technology that is not yet perfected and that aims to let the oil companies produce ever more and for ever longer. When will the political parties in Canada finally understand that the green transition means moving towards less oil, not more? The Honourable Minister for the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for her question. I would like to invite her to reread the budget because more than $9.1 billion to fight climate change is in it $1.7 billion to continue to help Canadians turn towards the electrification of their cars, hundreds of millions of dollars to help Canadians and Quebecers to reduce their home energy bills. And IPCC, in its latest report, talks about uh, capture and storage as being an essential technology to reach our 2050 ambitions. The Honourable Member from Manicouagan. Mr. Speaker, I would like to ask my colleague to re-re-read the IPCC report. In Alberta, Radio Canada has the headline, and I quote, federal budget delights Alberta oil companies and businesses. They are thrilled. They are delighted. That is not good news in the fight against climate change. The wolf is happy about the new layout of the sheepfold. Mr. Speaker, if Canada, with this Minister for the Environment, with a supposedly progressive coalition of Liberals and NDP, is incapable of doing anything more about climate change, anything other than delighting oil companies, and what should Quebecers conclude? The Honourable Minister, thank you. Mr Speaker, I'd like to remind my colleague that the IPCC report states that greenhouse gas emissions have to, uh, will level for the next few years and then go down. And that's what is already happening in Canada. By 2030, a 43% decrease. Our ambition is 40 to 45% reduction, Mr Speaker. And honestly, I'm always slightly uncomfortable because my colleague should know that her leader, the former Quebec F Environment Minister, has no lessons to teach us on the matter because of his past records. For Edmonton Mill Woods. Mr. Speaker, more and more Canadians continue to struggle to make ends meet. Yeah. Two thirds of Canadians say that inflation and the affordability crisis are their top economic concern. Six years of Liberal governance and inflationary policies got us to where we are today. Soaring inflation, a devastating housing crisis, and hardworking Canadians struggling to pay for food, rent, and their mortgages. Why do the Liberals continue to spend more and more of Canadians' money without getting any results? It's not working. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. 
Mr. Speaker, we understand that global inflation is having a significant impact on the household budgets of Canadian families. That's why we're focused on affordability in Budget 2022. Let me give you three quick examples. We are providing dental care for Canadian families who have incomes less than $90,000 per year. We will reduce child care costs by 50% this year and to $10 a day over time. And we will introduce a suite of measures to address the cost of housing. This budget, like our government, is focused on making life more affordable. The Honourable Member for Sarnia Lambton. Mr. Speaker, my riding has a lot of seniors that are struggling to make ends meet with the rising costs of food, gas and home heating. There is no affordable housing left in my riding and this government has done nothing to address the rising cost of inflation that's making everything worse. So why are they taking from grandma and the young people and when will this NDP Liberal government give them a break? Yay. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for the question, and it's interesting when the Conservatives show that they uh, say that they care about seniors, yet continuously vote af uh, against initiative after initiative after initiative for seniors. Budget 2022 provides great news and will make a real difference in the lives of seniors. We've announced the creation of a dental care for seniors program. Starting in 2023, seniors age 65 and up with a family income of less than $90,000, will be able to access dental care. And again, an additional $20 million for the new Horizons for Seniors program to continue supporting senior-serving organizations. Mr. Speaker, we have the backs of Canadian seniors. Mr. Gillette Flanborough, Glen Glenbrook. Hey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Inflation is at highest level in 30 years. The price of literally everything is going up and up. Yep. Inflation is squeezing Lucia and her husband, who live just down the road from me. They struggle with everyday essentials while also dealing with debilitating medical conditions. The cost of living is the number one issue facing Canadians. Yet, yesterday's budget offered no plan. It just digs the hole deeper and adds more $1.70 per litre fuel to the fire. So, Mr. Speaker, let me ask again, why does Lucia have to pay the price for this Prime Minister's vanity projects. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, global inflation is having a significant impact on household budgets. So it is good news that affordability is referenced 119 times in Budget 2022. We are increasing the federal minimum wage to $15.55 per hour. We're indexing important programs like the Canada Child Benefit and OAS and GIS to inflation. We're implementing an economic growth plan that creates jobs and grows our economy. And we are doing all of this while lowering our debt to GDP ratio because this is what a fiscally responsible government does. The Honourable Member for Cumberland Colchester. Hey. Mr. Speaker, every day I get calls about uh, the, the cost of living crisis that Canadians are undergoing. They raise concerns about the price of chicken, beef, bacon, milk, coffee, sugar, maple syrup, fresh vegetables, fresh fruit, ice cream, potato chips, the list goes on. Heating fuel, gasoline, electricity, cell phone bills, home repairs, clothing, alcohol, beer and wine, and of course the price of a home. We know the price of everything is increasing at a pace which is much greater than their paycheck. When will the Spendy P Liberals admit they're failing Canadians, which leaves them falling farther and farther behind? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, Budget 2022 is entitled A Plan to Grow Our Economy and Make Life More Affordable. It is a plan that invests in people, and it's a plan that helps that will help build a Canada where no one gets left behind. The budget addresses some of Canada's greatest challenges, including housing affordability, climate change, economic growth, and Indigenous reconciliation. Everyone in this House has a duty to help fight for a country that is worth fighting for. That is what we have tried to do in our first seven years, and that is exactly what we are continuing to do with this budget. The Honourable... Okay, here I have uh, the Honourable Member for Elmwood Transcona on my list. I'm just... All right, we're good. The Honourable Member, Elmond Transcona. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, two new reports this week show that while Canadians are struggling to put food on the table, big corporations in the grocery business are padding their pockets with record profits. Cargill alone reported $5 billion in net income in 2021, over double their net income from just last year. Big companies are taking advantage of economic uncertainty to jack up prices by far more than the increase in their costs. Instead of condoning this profiteering, when will the Liberals apply the tax measures announced just in yesterday's budget 
to these other industries that are profiting off high prices while Canadians struggle. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, in addition to our middle class tax cuts, Budget 2022 proposes additional measures that will make Canada's tax system more fair while promoting economic growth. This includes a permanent 1.5% corporate tax increase on profits over $100 million for bank and life insurance companies, new measures to prevent the use of foreign corporations to avoid Canadian tax, and a tax cut for small businesses as they continue to grow and create new jobs for Canadians. That's responsible fiscal management. That's fair tax policy, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. Over 80% of Indigenous peoples live off reserve. They are 11 times more likely to use a shelter. The Liberals promised a for Indigenous, by Indigenous, urban, rural and northern housing strategy since 2017. But budget after budget, there was no mention of it. Now that the NDP has pushed the Liberals to take action, they are only proposing $300 million to initiate a strategy over five years. This is not good enough. Will the Liberals make the necessary investments for a for Indigenous, by Indigenous, urban, rural and northern housing strategy? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member opposite for the question. And, and while the other side is talking about what is in the budget, I want to talk about today what is in the budget. We have historic investments in Indigenous housing. We have historic investments in, in Jordan's principle. We have historic investments in infrastructure. We have historic investments in mental health. Overall, Mr. Speaker, we've invested more than $27 billion wow, for Indigenous wow, issues. Wow. On this side of the House, we're committed to reconciliation, we're committed to moving forward on Indigenous issues, and we're committed to working with the member opposite to make sure that we're doing everything possible for Indigenous people in Canada. The Honourable Member for Vaughan Woodbridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Pleasure. Mr. Speaker, Housing, housing has been top of mind for so many Canadians, especially first-time home buyers and middle-class families like those in my riding of Vaughan Woodbridge. Yesterday's historic budget was a housing-focused budget with important investments and initiatives. Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Housing and my great friend please share with this House some of the key measures that will help ensure every Canadian has a safe and affordable place to call home? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my colleague for that very important question. We have seen housing become unaffordable. That's why the housing is the centerpiece of the budget 2022. We are making unprecedented investments to doubling housing construction, helping Canadians buy their first home, cap unfair practices that drives up the price of housing, and support the construction of affordable housing. Mr. President, the federal leadership we took it and we will continue to do because we will deliver the homes that people need all across the country. The Honourable Member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. All talk and very little action. Yep. The goal for many young Canadians is home ownership, which was once considered a common occurrence for young Canadians, <laughs> is now completely out of reach for many. For months, this government has told young Canadians that they are being listened to. Mr. Speaker, this is clearly not the case. Instead of introducing bloated bureaucratic programs wrapped up in red tape, why is their only solution to give another $1,400 per person of debt and fail to get results? Yeah. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the colleague for the question. Canadians across the country have seen access to property become extremely difficult, even impossible. It's unacceptable. That is why Budget 2022 presents concrete measures and investment of $200 million to develop uh, uh, purchase to own, allow people to uh, buy a first home, Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, leadership on housing has something we've been taking since 2017. We'll continue to do it because they did nothing when they were in government. Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday's budget will not put more money into the pockets of young families in Ivanhoe. It won't build houses for people in Tamworth. And it won't 
fix the labor shortage plaguing the entire construction industry across my riding. What Canadians want and what Canadians need is a foundational plan from this government to fix our broken housing sector. This means lowering inflation, lowering the debt, letting Canadian families keep their hard-earned money. Mr. Yeah. Speaker, when will this government stop holding ambitious, home-seeking Canadians back and start helping them? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. We are lowering the debt. Our net to our net debt to GDP ratio is consistently declining, as evidenced by this budget. We continue to have the best fiscal balance sheet among countries right across the G7. And I would remind my colleague, when she talks about growth, that she is actually downplaying the incredible growth that Canadians are creating in our country. 6.7 per cent growth in Q4, Mr. Speaker. And I would like the member's office to acknowledge the importance of our incredible fiscal track, Mr. Speaker. What my colleague is doing is to not <clears throat> Order. Well, we've made it to 27 questions. This is awesome. The Honourable the Honourable Member for King Vaughan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Using the example in the budget. A couple earning $90,000 per year would qualify for a home purchase of $355,000. Using the tax-free savings account in 2027, the couple will be eligible for a $500,000 purchase price if all other variables, including mortgage rates, remain constant. Failing Liberal housing policy has doubled the price of home to 816000 Why is this government continuing to fail aspiring homeowners? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, no government in Canadian history has invested more in the creation of housing than our government through this budget. We are there in order to ensure that more homes will be created. And what I meant by we made it 27 of the questions without a whole lot of heckling, which I thought was really, really good. So let's uh, let's just back up a little bit. Let's, uh, let's uh, let the uh, Parliamentary Secretary answer the question. The Honourable Member, the, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, I think the Conservatives are so excited by our housing policy in this budget that they can't help themselves. We are investing a historic amount in the creation of housing in this country, and it is going to help each and every Canadian purchase a home. We have incentives for first home buyers. We have plans to create co-op housing. We have plans in order to ensure that affordable housing is there so that every Canadian can put a roof over their heads. The Honourable Member for Langley Aldergrove. Yeah. Well, that was very amusing. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, this government's first time home buyers incentive program is a bust. I speak to home builders and mortgage brokers and realtors and prospective first time buyers who tell me that the program doesn't work in Canada's more expensive real estate markets. The average price of a home in my riding of Langley Aldergrove is now higher than the upper limit permitted under the program. So why is this NDP Liberal government doubling down on this failed and discredited program? Here, here. Here, here. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Housing. Merci, Monsieur le Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to remind my Honourable colleague all the benefits, not only the national housing strategy to help people pay their rent, it also helped a number of people buy a home. The investment, the historic investment being made in 2022 will support new homeowners and give them the homes that they're dreaming of. The Honourable Member for Shefford. Mr. Speaker, in this budget, the Liberals are betraying seniors. Not only are they not increasing the health care transfers, not only are they depriving seniors under 75 of the old age security increase, they are also failing to keep their own promises as insufficient as they are. They promised to improve the guaranteed income supplement for the lowest income seniors. They promised a tax credit for seniors who continue to work. They promised to improve the natural caregiver tax credit. These are their own promises. Why did they fail to keep them? Secretary. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. From the beginning, our government's priority has been to help the most vulnerable. That's why we've worked so hard to strengthen income security and the old age security that they rely on. Our plan delivers on our promise to increase old age security by 10% for seniors 75 and older. We will continue to deliver for seniors, especially those who need it most as they age and as their needs increase. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Shefford, uh, Mr. Speaker, clearly they're creating two classes of seniors. Not only are the priorities of seniors completely missing from the budget, the government is even trying to show that seniors no longer need support, uh, as if they were being spoiled rotten, as if seniors were wrong to be concerned about the quality of health care in the public long-term care homes, as if they were wrong to think that it's unfair that some are getting less in old age security than others to deal with the same increased in cost of living. Why is the government denying the reality that seniors are facing and the real concerns that they have? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. President, Mr. Speaker, we too are concerned about the cost of living for our vulnerable seniors, and that is why all our programs for our vulnerable seniors are indexed to inflation. This means that the amounts are being increased along with the increase in the cost of living. Uh, I would invite my colleague to look at page uh, 223 of the budget, uh, where we talk about expanding and investing more in community programs specifically for seniors. So. The Honourable Member for Brandon Suris. The hypocrisy of the Liberal government knows no bounds, Mr. Speaker. After voting against our motion to leverage Canada's energy sector to free Europe from its dependence on Russian oil and gas, the Natural Resources Minister's announcement in France shows Conservatives were right on the issue. Oil and gas is the answer yeah. to Europe's energy needs. Absolutely. So will the Minister commit to measures to get energy infrastructure built to Atlantic Tidewater? <laughs> the Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, at a time of, of great crisis in Europe, of course, Canada is looking to assist our, our friends and our allies with some of their short-term requirements. That was what the incremental 300,000 barrels about. That is what some of the conversations we are having with the European Union are about. But I would say that we are also working with them very actively on their desire to accelerate the transition towards renewables and hydrogen. Canada is, is committed to working with Europe to ensure that we are helping them in the short term and in the long term to meet their their needs. The Honourable Member for Edmonton West. So apparently to this government, 1.5% is the new 2%. Despite supporting the Conservative motion to increase defence spending to 2% of GDP to meet our NATO obligations, newly announced spending only brings us to 1.5%. Oh, and 1.5% after a lengthy, drawn-out, comprehensive review. Stop the political meddling and buy equipment. There, I just performed their comprehensive review for them. <laughs> when will this government recognize the threats and get this equipment purchased for our, the men and women in our forces? The Honourable Parliamentary, Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of National Defence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our Canadian Armed Forces must be well equipped and well supported to fulfil the missions that we ask of them. That's why our government is building on the smart, critical investments we've made over the past years with a further $8, $8 billion announced yesterday, which will support immediate investments in our defence priorities, including our continental defences, alliance and collective security, and in the capabilities of the CAF, as well as cultural change, Mr. Speaker, cyber security and military support for Ukraine. This is good news for Canada and good news for the Canadian Armed Forces, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Bose. Mr. Speaker, for a month, the Minister of Agriculture knows that there will be a shortage, a shortage of Russian fertilizer for producers in eastern Canada. There has been no action, only words. Prices are climbing, and our farm families cannot afford to pay 35 percent more on orders that they placed in 2021. The sowing season is coming, and farmers need answers. Will the minister exempt orders placed before March 2nd from the 35 percent tariffs? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to reassure my colleague that we're working on this situation closely, along with the farm sectors and their representatives to date. Um, 
boats have come to Montreal and fertilizer is making its way to farmers and we're working in the long term to see what we can do. I'd like to remind my colleague that we have changed the rules of the and early payment program to ensure that uh, our farmers have access to liquidities early so that they can um, produce. Chateau -Gay the Honourable Member for Chateau -Gay Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In Budget 2022, our government is investing $1.7 billion to extend and expand the federal incentives for zero emissions vehicles program. And our government is also investing $3.8 billion to implement the first critical mineral strategy. Can the Minister of Environment and Climate Change tell us how these funds will help us to achieve our net zero goals for 2050? The Honourable Minister of Environment. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank my colleague, the member for Shadow Gaelic Cole, for her question and for her activism on the electrification of transportation. In order to support the energy transition and position Canada as a future economic power, we're investing not only in making electric vehicles more affordable, but also to ensure that Canada be a world leader throughout the supply chain from extracting essential minerals needed to make vehicles and batteries and building a national network of charging stations and guarantee that they are uh, that they use clean energy our government is here for canadians we're making smart investments to position canada in the low carbon economy of tomorrow thank you river lanark from that kingston thank you mr speaker even though no contract has yet been signed to use the milk from its proposed 2200 goat prison farm, the government pr uh, continues to build dairy facilities at the Joyceville and Collins Bay institutions. Given the absence of a contract, it is strange that the government continues to act and to spend as if it still plans to use prison labour to produce goat milk for export. Therefore, will the, promise, the government promise to never sign any contract that involves the use of prison labour for export products? The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleague for the question. The Penitentiary Agricultural Program helps federal inmates gain the employment skills that are required to find meaningful employment in the community, which enhances their integration. In fact, we know offenders who participate in these programs are three times less likely to reoffend and find themselves back in custody. And that's why I'm pleased to announce that the Correctional Services of Canada has indeed awarded a contract in Joyceville. We'll continue to work with my colleague and others in this chamber so that we we can see this a project to completion. Of course, we will make sure that that contract, contract complies with all of Canada's international obligations. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Lanark Frontenac Kingston. Well, Mr. Speaker, for it to comply with all of our international agreements, we'd have to pay prison labour uh, market wages. We'd have to ensure they have all benefits that are provided to uh, to uh, free work labour. So the question that now arises, now that we learn the contract has been signed, is this: Has the government? guaranteed that prisoners will be paid market wages or alternatively has it guaranteed that none of this will be used for export to China as in their original plan one or the other or else we're breaking international law wow. the honorable minister of public safety Mr. Speaker, I, I agree with my uh, honourable colleague that, of course, we want to uh, treat inmates fairly and we want to compensate them fairly, and that's why I'm pleased to share with him and all members that we have awarded the contract through the Correctional Services of Canada. We're going to make sure that those inmates are getting the skills, the experience that they require to become positive contributing members to society, Mr. Speaker, and we'll work with all members to make sure that that experience and that training is done in accordance with all of Canada's international obligations. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Leeds, Grenville, Thousand Islands and Rideau Lakes. Well, the prison farm in Joyceville, Ontario is also the home to a provincially inspected abattoir that serves eastern Ontario farmers. There's been a surge in buying local meat and farmers have stepped up to meet that demand. The facility operator will be retiring and if we lose the abattoir there, there will be tremendous strain placed on processing capacity in eastern Ontario. Will the Minister of Public Safety offer that license to another operator or will the abattoir be closed? 
The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Um, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my honourable colleague for the question and for his advocacy in his community. Uh, I have committed to working with him and other members who are engaged in the process of making sure that we have these programs uh, come back to, to, to total fruition in the community. As I said, Mr. Speaker, these programs ensure that inmates are equipped with the tools, the experience and the skills that are necessary to safely reintegrate into their communities. I know my honourable colleague raised this is a specific issue with regards to licensing. We're engaging with him and will continue to do so. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Etobicoke Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the world has watched in horror over the past few weeks as Russia continues its unprovoked and horrific full-scale invasion of Ukraine. The Ukrainian people are not just fighting for their own freedom, they're fighting for all of us. Canada has taken strong action to support the Ukrainian people in that fight. Before Russia's invasion began, Canada began providing military support to Ukraine and has continued to provide significant military support. I was proud that Budget 2022, which was introduced yesterday, includes additional support to Ukraine. So could the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of National Defence update Canadians on the support that was included in yesterday's budget? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member of Etobicoke Centre for his incredible work and commitment on this, on this file and on this crisis uh, throughout. Uh, Canada is one of the lead countries in NATO when it comes to supporting Ukraine, Mr. Speaker, and now we are stepping up even more with an additional $500 million to provide further military aid to Ukraine. And as Ukrainian Canadian Count Congress said yesterday, this is a crucial and timely decision. Our government will continue to give our Ukrainian friends the tools they need to win this war. And like the member from Etobicoke Centre, Mr. Speaker, we will not rest. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Nunavut. In yesterday's budget, there were no new funds to help stop the crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls and two-spirit two people. This is extremely disappointing. Under this government, the genocide against Indigenous women, girls and two-spirit continues. New Democrats have been fighting for funding to implement all, all of the calls for justice to help stop the violence. When will this government finally provide funds to save Indigenous women, girls and two-spirit people's lives? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Mr. Speaker, uh, I thank the member opposite for her question and her passion and her dedication. Uh, I sit with her on the Indigenous Northern Affairs Committee, and I, I, I know the opposite member has heard me say that we have $2.2 billion put aside uh, for over the next five years to uh, address the missing and murdered Indigenous women's calls to justice. But I also want to talk about the important work that we've currently done with that money, including $85 million for Indigenous women's shelters across Canada. Also, we're continuing to move forward on cultural spaces in communities. This week, our minister just announced $16 million uh, for funding for cultural spaces uh, in, in Ontario and Quebec to address cultural, uh, to address the cultural uh, importance of for Indigenous women to continue to practice their culture, to continue to practice their language, and continue to be proud of who they are. And our government is committed to Indigenous women across Canada. And that's all the time for our question period today. But I thought, since some of you might not be sticking around for the, uh, for the rest of the debate, I want to wish each and every one of you a happy Easter and enjoy connecting back into your writings uh, for a couple of weeks. So enjoy your paca tut et a tuts. Daily routine of business. Affair courant. Depot document. Tabling of documents. Project de Introduction of government bills. Declaration. Statements by ministers. Reports from interparliamentary delegations. Presenting reports from committees. Introduction of private members' bills. Premier lecture. First reading of Senate public bills. Senate. Motions. And presenting petitions. Uh, the Honourable Member for Winnipeg Centre. Mr. Kerr, there you go. Give it, a, give it another try there, member for Winnipeg Centre. No, I'm not getting any audio from your headset. Do you, do you mean Winnipeg South Centre? There we go. Got, I got you now. So go, go, go for your uh, petition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am pleased.